Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, Machu van der Poel cements his place in cycling's history books by taking his first ever elite road race world title. I'll be looking back at what could only be described as an epic edition of the race. I'll also wrap up all the other racing from last week and talk you through the many transfers that have been confirmed since August the 1st. And some teams have been very, very busy. This week in the world of racing, we learned that the Nigerian kit is the best in cycling. Check this out. I mean, you can't miss them coming. That is the coolest outfit that I've seen at the Super World Championships. We also learned that tandem track sprinting is not for the faint of heart. I had my heart in my mouth watching those events last week. Incredible. And finally, we learned that Machu van der Poel is the king of one day racing. He's not won a huge amount this year, but when he has won, he has won big. I would imagine that he had six goals at the start of this season. San Remo, Flanders, Roubaix, stage at the Tour de France, World Champs Road Race and World Mountain Bike Championships. Well, as of Sunday, with five of those races now done, he's won three of them and finished second in one of the others. His victory yesterday at the UCI men's road race made history as he became the first male rider to win both the cyclocross and road world titles. Not just in a single year, as he's done, but ever. He'll compete at the XCO event later this week where he'll have the chance to equal Pauline ferron Prevost, who held those same three titles back in August of 2015. Now, there were three key points to find a Paul's victory. Number one, during the one hour enforced break, whilst the police removed protesters on the side of the road, he found a local house and used their toilet, presumably for a number two, lightening the load and allowing for a more comfortable ride later on. Uh, number two, he was super relaxed and not visible during the race unless he absolutely needed to be, or unless he was making a significant move off the front. And number three, he was just stronger than anybody else when it mattered. His winning attack was like a training exhibition. He didn't wait until Van Aert had done a turn on the front, then tried to catch him out by surprise from behind and come past at massive speed. No, he made his attack in full view of Van Aert, who was on his wheel at the time. Not for long though. By the time he got to the top of that climb, he distanced him, as well as Pogaccia and Pedersen, never to be seen again. Not even after this incident. And I've got to say, he was lucky to get away with this, not necessarily from a physical point of view, but from a bike point of view. He could so easily have broken his rear mech, slipped his chain or something else, but the only damage was to his shoe, with one of his boa dials breaking off. He was soon back on his bike though, ripping that dial off completely, and in total, I reckon it was only 15 seconds from the moment he hit the deck to the moment he was back up to full speed. Uh, given the nature of the circuit in Glasgow and the lack of race radios, it meant that the chasers had no idea of what had happened and probably didn't find out until after they'd finished the race. Van der Poel was never really in their sights and by the finish, he had over a minute and a half's advantage and plenty of time to celebrate in front of the huge crowds. So how much does this mean to Mathieu Van der Poel? Well, here's what he had to say after his latest triumph. It was one of the biggest goals um, I had left. Um, and to win it today is uh, yeah, amazing. Um, it uh, almost completes uh, my career, in my opinion. So, yeah, for me, it's uh, maybe the biggest victory on the road. And I cannot uh, imagine yet riding in the rainbows for a year. Almost completes his career, which makes you wonder what he thinks he's got left to achieve. The mountain bike world title this week, perhaps? Well, it's probably as good a time as any to look back at what he's already won at this point. Five elite cyclocross world titles. Milano San Remo, Harry Roubaix, the Tour of Flanders twice, Amstel Gold, a stage and a stint in the yellow jersey at the Tour, a stage and a stint in the pink jersey at the Giro d'Italia. The only two monuments he's yet to conquer, Liège and Lombardy, the only Grand Tour stage and leader's jersey missing at the Vuelta. But beyond any of that, beyond the mountain bike world title, I think what would complete his career is an Olympic gold medal. Whether he will focus on the road or mountain bike title in Paris next year remains to be seen, but I'm pretty sure that is what will be driving him for the next 12 months. Now, if you compare the results I just listed to those of Van Aert in his career, you realise what a chasm has developed in their respective achievements in one-day races. Whilst Van der Poel now has four monuments and a world title on the road, Van Aert only has Milano San Remo. For many rides, of course, one monument would make a career, but Van Aert, 
he's not just any rider, is he? He is one of the most talented cyclists the world has ever seen, another multidiscipline monster, and yet he's increasingly becoming the nearly man. Whilst he eclipses Van der Poel at the Tour de France with nine stage wins versus one, plus his green jersey, of course, at the one day races, he's falling short. Second at the Olympics, two silvers now at the Road World Championships, two silvers in the Time Trial World Championships, and six podium results in monuments since that victory at San Remo without a win. So is the difference physical or psychological? Well, I think it's a bit of both, but I think that the biggest difference between the two is that Van der Poel is willing to take more of a risk. He races in a way where it's obvious that he's willing to lose in order to win, whilst Van Aert doesn't like to leave anything to chance. He is always in the right place at the right time, always there or thereabouts when he needs to be, whilst Van der Poel is either on or off with seemingly nothing in between. Talking of consistency though, what about Tadej Pogacar? A bronze medal at the World Championships in a season where he began winning in February, recovered from a serious injury and finished second at the Tour de France. It was a brilliant group of riders, I've got to say, and I think I speak for many of you when I say I wish there'd been a medal for fourth place for Mass Pedersen, who finished just off the podium. The same top four from this year's Tour of Flanders, incidentally. Uh, now, I said it on the breakaway yesterday, but in a couple of decades' time, when we look back at photos from yesterday's race and from that podium ceremony, we are going to be reminded of what a golden age this is in cycling. Uh, Bogaccio went so deep, though, that he was taken out of the mix zone by his helpers when he started feeling dizzy and faint. There is a guy that is due a well-earned rest right now. Uh, other very notable performances on the day came from Alberto Betio, who for a while looks like he might just sail away with the win. It certainly felt like he deserved more than 10th, which he ended up with. Uh, Matt Denham too, whose seventh place came after being in the day's early breakaway. And Tom Schoyne, who is the only rider in the top 12 who did not compete at the recent Tour de France. Uh, now on to the Glasgow course. What did you think of it at home? There were certainly a few complaints from riders and teams on the lead up to yesterday's race, but it is hard to argue that it didn't produce a worthy winner, podium and top 10 to that fact. Uh, personally, I think the course should be significantly different year on year to give different types of riders a shot at the rainbow jersey. And the Glasgow circuit rewards punchy riders with great bike handling skills. Uh, the roadside crowds were also immense, which I thought was brilliant. So my only criticism of a route like that is that it leaves no hope to anybody who suffers a mechanical problem. We saw it with Christophe Laporte, with Mikel Biel and others, who were amongst a number of riders who had no chance to get back on terms by the time they found a bike change. Uh, Lawson Craddock titled his Strava file World Criterium Championships, and Chris Nalance described it as too hard in his post-race interview. So I would like to know what you think at home. Let me know in the comments section below whether you thought it was a worthy course or not for the World Championships road race. Right, on to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week. And this week, our focus is mainly on all of the World Championship events taking place. There are a lot of them. Track racing continues through to Wednesday. Plus, we have BMXing, trials, indoor cycling, the individual and mixed relay time trials, the short track cross country, and the XCO mountain biking, where you'll be able to see Van der Poel, Pidcock and Schurt in action on the men's side, Peterser and Ferron Prevot, amongst others, on the women's. But the week concludes with the women's road race this Sunday around that same city centre circuit in Glasgow. We'll be back with the breakaway post and pre-race show and live coverage of the entire race to see who will be crowned 2023 world champion. Territory restrictions do apply to all events in Glasgow. But it's not all about the world championships this week. I want to point you in the direction of a very exciting National Cycling League or NCL. The American-based crit series is characterised by constant sprints for points as teams vie for the overall title over the course of a whole season. The NCL is different to any crit race though that you may have watched in the past because the races are short, two hours long roughly, with sprint finishes at the end of every lap. Scoring points consistently is crucial, but 30% of the total points wait at the finish line, so everything could be decided there. And my favourite part of the NCL is that the men's and women's teams are fully aligned. So the final champion is decided when points are combined equally between the men's and women's teams. And we get loads of racing and action through each evening. Uh, now, another unique aspect of the NCL series is substitutions. Teams are made up of six riders, but there's one on the sidelines waiting to sub in. Teams can optimise substitutes in the best way that they see fit. So ahead of the upcoming Miami and Denver event, which take place on the following two Sundays, so the 13th and 20th of August respectively, here are some highlights from the first race of the season in Miami.
that has certainly whetted the appetite. So be sure to tune into the Denver event, available exclusively on GCN Plus. Just be careful with the time difference. Sunday night over there is going to be the early hours of Monday morning here in Europe. Uh, on the world of cycling this week, I'm going to be joined by Max Stedman and Connor Dunn. We'll be looking back at the Men's Road Race Championships and asking if it was the hardest in recent times. A quick roundup of the other races that took place last week now, starting with the Tour of Poland, which really couldn't have been much closer from a GC perspective. After the individual time trial on stage six, Matej Mohoric led Joao Almeida by just one hundredths of a second. And so it all came down to the final stage. At one of the intermediate sprints on that final day, Mohoric got the better of the Portuguese rider to take a slightly more comfortable advantage of one second, and that's how things stayed to the end of the race. That marked his first overall win at a World Tour level stage race, and he donated all his prize money to the recent victims of flooding in Slovenia. Uh, that final stage was taken by Tim Malia, his second of the race, whilst the time trial itself was won by Matteo Catania. Mike, Coy and Vandenberg were the other stage winners at the race since this time last week. After the Tour de Lan, resident statistician Killian Kelly was overcome with emotion in what he saw as almost the most exceptional set of results there has ever been in the history of cycling. So in 2021, Michael Storer finished 97th on stage one, second on stage two, one stage three plus the GC, as well as winning the points and mountains classifications. Fast forward two years to just a week or so ago, Michael Storer was 97th on stage one, second on stage two, one stage three plus the GC, and the points classification, but he only came second in the mountains, therefore completely spoiling things. A pretty unlikely set of circumstances nonetheless, I think you would agree. Uh, a great ride by the Australian either way, particularly given this crash at the finish line of stage two, where he basically took himself off by sticking his elbow out in the sprint to the line with Cepeda. Uh, over at the Littleton Twilight Criterium in the USA, both the women's and men's races ended up in bunch sprints. Kendall Ryan took the former for Legion of Los Angeles, whilst Jordan Parra of the American Cycling Group took the men's. I mean, talk about fast and frantic. Those crits over in the USA are so intense. I think even Mathieu van der Poel would have a run for his money trying to win one of those. Short highlights are available on our GCN Racing YouTube channel, or you can watch back the full event on demand over on GCN+. Uh, right, on to the track events in Glasgow now, and as ever, there have been so many different events, I can't possibly go over all of them. However, in the women's individual pursuit, Chloe Dygart set the fastest qualifying time, and that evening went on to win the gold medal in that event. She caught Francesca Browser in the final. Uh, Dygart almost seemed a little disappointed, though, that she didn't beat her own world record in that event, but great that she's so close to her best again after what's been a torrid few years returning from injury. Fellow American Jennifer Valente took her first world title in the scratch race one day later, whilst the Netherlands were back to winning in the men's sprint event, beating Australia by just four one hundredths of a second in the team sprint. There was a new world record in the women's team sprint as the Germans took the title, so well done to Pauline Grabosch, Emma Hinzer and Leah Sophia Friedrich. Team GB actually also broke the previous record, but were beaten by Germany in that final. New Zealander Aless Andrews won the women's Kieran and Emma Hinzer of Germany the 500 metre time trial, but the most emotional win of the week was for Team GB in the women's team pursuit. Katie Archibald has been giving some very honest, open and heartfelt interviews in the lead up to the event. She lost her partner Rab Bordell this time last year, who tragically passed away through a cardiac arrest. I have so much respect for Katie to be able to talk about it in the way that she has and then to perform like that to boot. It also marked the first gold medal for Eleanor Barker since giving birth last year. The most exciting event, at least for me last week, was the men's individual pursuit finals which took place last night. With 1K to go, Dan Bigham of Great Britain was two seconds ahead of the man who he helps go as fast as possible, Filippo Ganna. But the big Italian just seemed to get stronger and stronger as the event went on, crossing the line just three hundredths of a second in front of the Brit, having taken a full second out of him on the final lap of the race. Uh, for the mountain bike events that have already taken place, make sure you check out the GMBN Racing News Show, which should be out today over on their channel, or catch up on demand if you're in the right territory over on GCN+. Uh, in other news, Alex Baudin was last week disqualified from the Giro d'Italia after traces of tramadol were found in a urine sample taken at the race. AD2 half suspended the rider, who is the second to have tested positive for the substance, after Naira Quintana last year. Uh, incidentally, the substance is not on the WADA list of banned uh, substances, but it is prohibited by the UCI. 
Robert Stannard has been suspended by his team Alperson de Koenig after being charged for an anti-doping rule violation by the UCI. Uh, the matter dates back to 2018 and 2019. No further details at this stage, but Stannard has refuted ever knowingly taking a banned substance. Philip Maciejuk of Bahrain Victorious has also been handed a suspension by the UCI. Uh, this one though for causing that mass pile up at the Tour of Flanders back in April. Not quite sure why it's taken this long to make their decision, but still. Right, I'll finish then with that contract news. And first up, Arno Demar has changed pro teams for the first time in his life. With immediate effect, he'll be racing in the colours of Arkea Samsic. Miles Scottson will join up with him at the start of next year. Andreas Lechnersund, pink jersey at the Giro this year, is one of a number of riders who've been signed by Uno X. He moves over from Team DSM, whilst Magnus Court moves over from EF Education Easy Post after a few very successful years with that team. Niels Pollitt has signed a three-year deal with UAE Team Emirates, a brilliant signing by them, you've got to say. All being well, he'll play a pivotal role in protecting Pogaccio during the Tour de France, particularly on the flatter stages, and in controlling during the early breakaway formation phases. Lionel Tamino will transfer from Alperson de Koenig to Lotto Destiny, Mario Schmidt to Jaco Alula, whilst Matteo Trentin joins Tudor, along with Dainese, Stora, Meerhofer, Stork and Krieger. And finally, according to Ciro Sconemilio of the Gazzetta della Sport, Yolo Cometa will change its name next year to Team Pulte. A blast from the past because Pulte was the lead sponsor of a big Italian team in the late 90s. Right, that is all for this week's show. I'm off to watch another action-packed week of bike racing, but I'll see you this time next week.